Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about um, orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy specifically, versus contemporary yoga. So what goes on in these yoga studios that you're seeing pop up everywhere? Why is the appeal so big? Why do women flock to yoga? Why does it seem like an addiction for women? Um, why does it seem to be helping people? Um, at, versus Eastern Orthodoxy. So why is there such a huge influx of converts to Orthodoxy? Um, and why is it better to be Orthodox? Is it better to be Orthodox versus do yoga? Is it better to do yoga? Anyway, so I have been in the yoga world for a while. Um, I was a teacher. Uh, I did teacher training. Um, I ran a studio with a friend of mine, um, outside during the lockdowns. So I was very involved in the yoga world. I was a very dedicated practitioner. And in the last couple of years, two years specifically, a little over two years, I've uh, converted to be Eastern Orthodox. So um, I have a little bit of experience in both worlds. Um, I'm glad that I'm Eastern Orthodox. I think that's the way to go. And so tonight I just wanted to talk about a few of the differences, um, how I can kind of compare the two as spiritual practices and why Eastern Orthodoxy is um, the answer. So if one is looking for truth, uh, if there's really a soul longing for something that doesn't know what it is, um, that's what we're going to talk about. Do you go into yoga? Do you go into Orthodoxy? Where do you go? So, all right. Um, I'm going to start with... Um, breath work in yoga uh, and meditation versus divine liturgy, standing and singing. So in yoga, the idea is you're going to learn how to control your breath uh, and you're going to meditate, which um, can look a lot of different ways. But for the purposes of this video, let's just talk about breath work. When you go to your mat in these yoga studios, they teach you to close your eyes um, and focus on your breath and learn to calm the breath. And there's a few different ways to do it depending on whatever your intention is. Sometimes you wanna get more energy. Sometimes you want to calm your nerves. Sometimes you want to, I don't know, they say balance the brain, the left and the right hemispheres. There can be all these kind of scientific things that they, it's like biohacking using breath work and they call it pranayama. So, um, that is what's going on in yoga. The intention is you're looking at yourself, you're practicing a science kind of with your body to try to achieve peace. So the goal kind of without them saying it, well, they do even say it, is peace and enlightenment and awakening to your higher self. That's the goal in yoga. Um, the Christian God, the true God is never spoken of. Yoga mentality, you are God, and we're going to just have you reawaken to that, right? So, um, and you can start doing that with your breath work. So that's what a lot of yogis are doing. And they can pull you into that mentality by saying, ah, breath work will calm your nerves if you have anxiety or it'll lift you up if you have depression. So even if you don't go to your first yoga class looking for enlightenment, right? You just, you have anxiety or depression and you're looking for answers and yoga is um, promoting that they can help you with that by, you know, with breath work. Um, so it's very popular for people to go in and experiment because of that. And then later on, when you start advancing your practice, you start reaping the benefits of feeling a sense of peace. So that's what's going on when it comes to pranayama, which is breath work. Um, in Eastern Orthodoxy, we have the divine liturgy and we stand for an hour and a half, two hours, however long the divine liturgy goes for, which is usually that. Um, and your breath work is singing hymns and singing through the entirety of the divine liturgy. So you're participating with a community towards the altar, towards Christ. So your intention is worshiping Christ, becoming like him, being in his presence, presenting yourself to him with um, additional parishioners. So it's a community event. Um, and the breath work would be standing a posture with the singing. Um, it's, it really is a full body experience and you kind of, you don't lose yourself in a way that the yoga 
mentality does. You kind of drift off into nothingness when you're meditating. When you're standing in divine liturgy, you, you lose yourself, but not in a way that you lose yourself. You still have you. You're still 100% present. You just feel the it's, there's there's times where you can truly feel the grace of God, which is a different conception than in yoga where you feel peace and then you leave the yoga studio and you're back to your crappy self. Could be an hour later, could be a couple days later. Uh, in my personal experience, I have experienced that peace that comes with pranayama, with breath work, um, but it goes away. And it also brings a false sense of entitlement that you are more spiritual now that you've done this, um, which is pride and it's arrogance and it's ignorance and it makes people not like you. And technically you don't, you think that you're above other people because you uh, start breathing better, right? You're more spiritual somehow. Whereas in divine liturgy, you're not more spiritual than anyone else. Um, you, it brings a sense of humility, uh, or that's the goal anyway. I mean, it's a sense of like learning your place with God and hoping that he can come down, come into your heart, clean it up. So you're asking, you're begging for him to come and help you to stay close to him. So two completely different intentions. Also in yoga, you're by yourself on your mat. It's very isolated in the divine liturgy and Eastern Orthodoxy. You are with people. It's a beautiful event. You dress up. Um, you're presenting yourself with, with other people, yoga, not like that. You're supposed to keep your own mind on your own mat and do your own thing. Uh, very different, um, with similar goals. Yoga's breath work does seem to be the cheap, quick piece, like the quick answer, the addiction answer. Uh, yeah, just give me some peace, you know, <laughs> whereas going to the divine liturgy every Sunday and maybe vigil the night before is the long game. You are dedicated. You are changing your life slowly. Um, you uh, have accepted that uh, a completely different worldview that there is God and we are trying to be in his presence, trying to be like him, struggling with against our vices. Um, whereas in yoga, you just show up, you breathe, you're good, bro. There's no there's no. conviction of lifestyle changes. There may be health lifestyle changes that you're making. You know, when you start doing yoga, um, you can start eating better. You'll see your body start to get better because you're moving your body. Uh, you'll become more aware of your lifestyle. Uh, in general, you won't want to be on the couch as much because you're just, you're becoming like more aware of your body. And it does, it really does help your body. Um, you get more in shape, you get more in tune with what you're putting in your body. Um, but in the long run, there's a big piece missing, uh, which is God. So in Eastern Orthodoxy, that is a part of it standing for, even after being a yogi for, gosh, uh, I would say seven years. Um, yeah, seven years. I had so much trouble standing in liturgy for two hours. And that's after all these downward facing dogs and all these forward folds and all these back bends thinking in my head that I was so athletic. And then I go into an Eastern Orthodox divine liturgy service, a worship service, and was significantly humbled because old ladies were standing up better than I was. I could, I mean, my back was hurting, my feet were hurting. Um, and that's not me being humble. That's a reality um, of how sad that, you, you think that you're so in shape with yoga, but the real skills that you have, you, you don't actually cultivate the ability just to stand there and worship God or sing. So all that breath work doesn't do anything to your vocal cords or help you to sing and to praise. So that was my first point. Uh, my second point, um, I was going to talk a little bit about the yamas and the niyamas versus the Ten Commandments. So in orthodoxy, there are yamas and niyamas, all right? So let's see. Yes, I pulled this up. Okay, so the yamas are, th this is basically like the Ten Commandments of yoga. And this is what they teach. They teach it in the classes. They teach it in teacher training for to teach the teachers to teach the classes. So this is this is a big deal. There can be dedications of these different 
yamas or niyamas. There's five of each um, in, for a different class. Like the whole class can be dedicated to one of them. So I'm just going to go over them really quickly so you know. Um, the yamas are your external ethics and the niyamas are your internal ethics. So we'll start with the external ethics, the first five, right? Uh, one is non-harming. Two is satya, which means truthfulness. Okay. Three is asteya, which means non-stealing. Four is uh, brahmacharya, which means unity. Um, and five is aparigraha, which means simplicity or generosity. Then we go to the niyamas, which are the internal ethics, how you're supposed to govern yourself. Uh, six is saucha, which is purity, cleanliness. Seven is santosha, which means contentment in all things. Eight is tapas, which means discipline in your life, fiery discipline in your life. Nine is svadiyaha, which means self-study, the study of self. That's one of their Ten Commandments, right? And finally, ten is Ishvara Pradi Yan, or excuse me, Ishvara Pradinaha, which means surrender, service to something bigger. All right, so those are the Ten Commandments of yoga, or the Yamas and the Yamas. This is a big deal in yoga. Um, and if you look at them, and then okay, real quick, just to contrast that, I'm going to talk. I'm just going to go through the Ten Commandments really quickly. Number one, I am the Lord your God. You shall worship the worship the Lord your God and serve Him. Um, and you only shall you serve, and Him only shall you serve. Excuse me. Number two, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number three, remember that to keep the holy to keep holy the Sabbath day. Number four, honor your father and your mother. Number five, you shall not kill. Number six, you shall not commit adultery. Number seven, you shall not steal. Number eight, you shall not bear false witness. Number nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Do you guys see the difference here? Because I do. <laughs> There's uh, the yamas and the niyamas. Don't harm people. Be truthful. Don't steal from people. Unity. Come together, right? Um, generosity. Purity. Contentment. Have fiery discipline. Study yourself and surrender to something bigger. Versus the Ten Commandments. It is so easy to look at the yamas and niyamas. And this is kind of what happens when you go to a yoga studio. They will pick one of these yamas or niyamas. And then the yoga teacher, who has absolutely no discipline, we're just, you know, struggling to find out. And I, you know, I say that a lot of these yoga teachers actually have a lot of discipline in their own practice. They are very dedicated to their practice. Um, they show up every day. They practice hard. Uh, they struggle, they fall, they get back up, they attempt to teach a class when they're nervous. So actually, I take that back. A lot of these, the, most of these teachers are, are very good natured and, and um, have good intentions. Um, the problem is you can interpret these yamas and niyamas any way you want. I've heard them interpreted a million ways because the yoga teacher can just interpret each of these there, however they want or however they are feeling that day. And they literally do make things up on the spot. It's kind of like they're their own Pope and they have their own class for the day. They're, they have their own church for the day and they get to, you know, bring up some kind of ethic that they've chosen. Like, let's say truthfulness. How can you be truthful in your life today? Well, let's think about that. Well, today you could make sure that you tell your husband if you blah, 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 whatever. Right. Um, that's all well and good, but it's almost like social ethics where everyone agrees. Um, whereas the Ten Commandments, things like do not commit adultery. That's that's pretty firm. It's pretty stable. And it's not coming from you making it up. I mean, that is coming straight from God. And that's a very hard thing to do. I mean, and that is also internally not to commit adultery, not even to think. I mean, so the level of conviction here when you're following God versus following your own kind of social ethic or, you know, um, whatever you think sounds good to everybody. Oh yeah, that sounds good. We should be truthful. Like, but what actually does that mean in the 10 commandments? You have obviously actual things. 
I am the Lord, your God. You shall worship the Lord, your God, and serve only him, right? That's pretty powerful. There are no other gods, including yourself, which is number nine on the yamas and niyamas is self-study. So as I mentioned kind of earlier in the video, in yoga, you are God and you practicing yoga and practicing your breathing and showing up to the mat, you worship, you study yourself like you're worshiping God. There's that sounds to someone who doesn't know about Eastern Orthodoxy, someone who's really struggling, somebody who's lost and starving for spirituality. And then you learn that you have all the power to find God yourself. Um, it's very appealing. And um, anyway, so it's just very appealing to think that you yourself can study yourself and find out more about God. This is appealing for people that have been traumatized because other people are mean. If your parents have been mean and they're representations of God to you, then you would think God is a mean God. And maybe you don't want to go to church. It's, it would be better just to study yourself. Then you don't have to deal with the yuckiness of others. I don't trust other people. I don't want to go learn about God. Here, I can stay on my own mat. I can get a better body, right? And I can... Um, I believe that I am this God and I can just study myself and get better and better and better. It's really appealing for people that have been hurt and that don't know spirit, that don't know, um, that don't know that there is another answer and it's not Protestantism. It's not Catholicism. So people that have been hurt in those other religions and, and a lot of people have religious trauma is a real thing. So people that do not want to go to church, it's not just because they're bad people. The people that are on the yoga mats because they don't want to go to church because they think Christians are bad. They're not bad people. It's because they legit, not all of them. Obviously, some of them are bad people, <laughs> but I'm talking generalities. Most of the people have been hurt um, by the idea of God from religious abuse or from mean parents or somebody at the church has shamed them or told them they were going to hell for X, Y, Z. So then they go to, a but, but you still need God and you still need worship. So what do you do if you don't know about Eastern Orthodoxy or you don't trust uh, the church authority, you will go to yoga. You just worship yourself, bro. You're good. Anyway, so uh, this is not to condone that, um, but I'm just speaking from personal experience where it does give you something to do when you're starving. So if you are really looking for spirituality, it's, it's not lasting, it's cheap, but it will get someone motivated to get out of depression temporarily and out and moving, right. And breathing. Eventually they will find out if, and this is my path, but they will find out that that's not enough. And it's not the truth. You can't just worship yourself. It's pretty obvious. You're not God. But you can lie to yourself for a very long time, especially when a lot of other people are in the same camp of lying to themselves that they are God. This is a big push in our society. And there's yoga studios everywhere. And you get to meet friends. We are in such an isolated community that now you're going to a yoga studio and people are saying, welcome. It's so good to see you again. Oh, that pose is great. Now you feel like people care about you and they're seeing your face. And wow, this is so much better than church. They were mean to me at church. They told me I was a sinner and going to hell. Why would I do that? Right? So um, again, not saying that this is right. I'm saying this is why they're at the studios. Um, because there are benefits. There are um, real, there are, there are real tangible differences that this practice can make in people's lives that are out of shape and that are starving spiritually. I was both of those. And yoga brought me out of a very dark place and moved me to a different place <laughs> where at some point I got the information that Eastern Orthodoxy existed, which is the true church. So rather than, again, the yamas and the yamas focusing your attention there going, I guess I'm regressing back. Uh, digressing back. Now you have the 10 commandments. Now you have also, uh, the Bible and the saints and the Psalter. Uh, we have church history. So, um, 
we have so many things to help us and our heart heal that people have been doing for the last 2000 years in the church and more. We have, um, we have a community in Eastern Orthodoxy. We have, we do have a hierarchy of people to look at. We are supported. Um, and the best part about it is it's true. This is the true faith. So there's something different about like going into a yoga studio, you get friendly faces and you get your own mat and you get your water. And so you feel, yeah, it's kind of a fun, fun activity and you get to move. Whereas when you walk into an Orthodox church, you get the incense and you get the icons, which are these gorgeous paintings of screen of uh, images from the Bible or from saints. Um, it is, it is the same it's not the same experience, but it's like that's that spiritual experience you got on the mat on steroids. And now you are entering almost like a heavenly zone that you thought was there on the yoga mat, but was nothing compared to entering divine liturgy for service or for any service for that matter. Just going into the Orthodox Church um, like a whole new world. You, and then obviously you start meeting people. So you have that camaraderie there. Um, and you have truth. It hits the heart differently. It hits the heart differently. And it's much more fulfilling. In yoga, there was always that yearning. You're there, but it's never quite enough. Now, that feeling of never quite enough is also there in the Orthodox Church. But you know what it is that you are begging to come into your life. Whereas in yoga, you really don't know. You're going to like, it could happen today that I could levitate. I don't know. I mean, I'm getting pretty spiritual. I don't know. I fell out of crow pose or I can't, I, I can't, I can't hit chin stand or running man. I'm not that spiritual. That guy must be so much more spiritual because he got running man. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, these are just, you know, more advanced yoga poses. Um, but yeah, there is an idea in yoga that the more advanced poses you get as well, the more advanced you are spiritually, um, <laughs> which is, is funny because God gives us different gifts. Some people just have more athletic bodies than other people. Some people just have better minds and intelligent capacity than other people. Some people are just more empathetic and kind and nurturers than other people. These are gifts that we have. So it's really silly to think that the more flexible you are, the more enlightened you are, the more of a spiritual being you've come become. But that is really what they believe. That is certainly what I believed for a little while. Um, and it does nothing good for your ego. Um, in the Orthodox Church, there's no yoga poses. You just stand and worship God in the presence of your fellows. So there's a humility there that you are just like everyone else. D d regardless of your gifts, we are all reaching out to God. We all need God's assistance, right? So uh, much more fulfilling of a concept. Humility also will save your life. Yoga does not teach humility. I mean, it. there are times that it says it does, but it doesn't. There's this idea of dissolution of the ego. Like we're going to get rid of our ego in here. We're going to dissolve the ego. It actually does the complete opposite. It's like, what was that from 1984? Double speak, right? Where they say one thing and it means the opposite. Um, yoga does the opposite. The more yoga you do, the bigger your ego becomes. That's what I experienced personally. Like you become better, your body gets better. You think that you're becoming more enlightened. It is absolutely the opposite of humility. Um, and it happens slowly and you don't even know it until one day you become Western Orthodox and realize, wow, I had it really backwards. And it's much more relieving to realize you don't have to get the perfect half moon pose to be one of God's children. You don't have to have phenomenal balance or uh, the headstand so perfectly that you could fall asleep for five minutes in it and be worthy of being spiritual. You don't, you just ask God for help and he will meet you wherever you are. It is, it is a complete paradigm shift. And it's so worth it to take that jump from yoga to Eastern Orthodoxy. Everything that you wanted in, in yoga is accessible and available in Eastern Orthodoxy and way more and gives you a purpose in life. In yoga, your purpose is to study yourself, just like it said in the, in the uh, Niyamas, right? Study yourself. 
surrender. Surrender to what? Right, that was the 10th one I said. Which one was that? Uh, yeah, the Niyamas. Surrender. <clears throat> what are you surrendering to? Everybody makes up their own version of what you're surrendering to. The universe, to what is. Now, if you don't think about this very much, it sounds great. Uh, okay, good. Well, I'm tired of fighting. Life is hard. Surrender? Awesome. <laughs> I just lie on my mat and like let all my emotions do whatever they need to do. And I can just lie here. I can cry. I can just dissociate, right? And no one's going to judge me. I can just check out and daydream. Awesome. Um, for traumatized people, this is really appealing. You have a safe space for an hour to check out and they call it surrender. That's all you need to do is surrender. And they never say to what, but for traumatized people, it's a safe space that they can lie down with other people present and just be there. Okay. Again, not condoning this, but I personally felt um, a lot of peace when I got to do this and I was protected. Like you just lie here. Now, obviously after being Eastern Orthodox, what am I surrendering to in yoga? Surrendering to life? Like, am I going to let life stamp on me? I mean, from an Eastern Orthodox perspective now we surrender to god's will god's will not the universe some weird idea that everything is the universe life is the universe you're the universe i'm the universe no no god's will which is our creator and we're the creation so we don't just lie there and let whatever happens happens we're not passive we are active in Eastern Orthodoxy. We struggle to do God's will. Whereas yoga is kind of like, just surrender, check out, bro. You're good. You worked hard. You did your breath work. And then you leave and you wonder why you still are sad or you're still drinking or you're still in toxic relationships. But I'm so enlightened, you know, like I've been meditating, right? It, people just don't get me because I've been <laughs> your life is still going to be that if you're doing yoga. Whereas in the church, you have now a whole community of people that are trying to live their life a certain way with certain rules that God gave us. And we have priests and elders in the church that can guide you and correct you when you're wrong. There's nobody really to correct your behavior in yoga. Your yoga poses, maybe. Your body will get better. The yoga teachers know what they're doing when it comes to your body and they can correct you. They will correct you and you will get better. But when it comes to your life, if you are like me, if you were starving for help with the trauma of just living and all the stuff that just hits you and you don't know what to do, you don't know who to cry to, who to turn to, yoga will not do that. It will do that temporarily, but it is fake. Long term. Eastern Orthodoxy is the only place to go for actual healing. It's like a therapy. That's what you were looking for in yoga. You will get it in Eastern Orthodoxy. So, okay, that's that. The Yamas versus the Niyamas, or Yamas and Niyamas versus the Ten Commandments. Let's see if I had any other points here. Uh, just a fun one. Um, mala beads versus the prayer rope. So I had mala beads. A lot of yogis carry these mala beads um, and they are just, you know, they look like the rosary. So that's what it was told to me. I was given a mantra by a spiritual teacher um, and it was to Hanuman, who is the monkey god. And I would just say this little mantra and I would go around the mala beads just like a rosary and say this weird Hindu mantra prayer in Hindu to Hanuman, which is one of the Hindu gods. I didn't really know what I was saying. I don't really know who Hanuman is. I have no, <laughs> you know, but I didn't have any context, but I liked being spiritual. My soul was dying for something spiritual. So it actually, it helped. I, it calmed me down. I would just say this thing. Now, when I switched to Eastern Orthodoxy, I of course got a prayer rope, uh, which I wish I had one on me so I could show you. But anyway, it's like the rosary, but it, it's the Eastern Orthodox prayer rope. Um, and we say the Jesus prayer. So there's not like multiple mantras to multiple gods. There's one prayer to one God. Um, and I remember it was really funny. I was like, can't I just use my mala beads for the Jesus prayer? And my godmother was like, no, 
So we burned them all of these because I was praying. Which one commandment was that? That was number, um, you shall, yeah, number one. You shall not have any other gods, right, other than me. Number one. Well, I was praying to Hanuman, the monkey god. So, of course, in orthodoxy, there's an idea that anybody who's not, any god who is not the one true god is a demon. And that's what I was doing. It was fake. But it felt good. Of course it did, because they're great liars. And I needed God. And he's like, oh, worship me instead. And that's what I was doing, because I didn't want, I, I didn't, in my mind, I didn't connect that I was running away from the true God because of trauma, right? Um, thinking I could do it myself. Anything but the real God, right? Hanuman, great. I can satisfy my soul. I don't have to really look at the real God because I don't trust him because my life was, was hard and I was mad at, at the real God. So I got Hanuman. <laughs> so anyway, that is the difference between mala beads and the prayer rope. Mala beads, you are saying a mantra to um, a Hindu god. And the prayer rope, you got the real thing. So make the switch if you are ready. It is worth it. Um, yeah, and there's a sense of after you do the mala beads with whatever god you're praying to, let's say mine was Hanuman, it was Hanuman, you just, you feel like you did your duty. Like you paid somebody off. Like, look, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, so I'm going to get better now. Whereas with the Jesus prayer, you're begging God to help you. You see the difference? So there's a different feeling in your heart. So it looks the same on the outside, but it's not the same. Mala beads versus prayer rope. Okay. Um, There's an idea in yoga called Chitta Vritti Nirodha, which is stopping the mind. This is something that they call a purpose in yoga. Chitta Vritti, vritti Nirodha, stopping the mind, cessation of the thoughts of the mind. And they say this is a good thing. And I believed it was a good thing. Um, now that I'm Eastern Orthodox and our purpose is to become like God, to get closer to God, to know God more, to struggle against our vices or our uh, passions is what we call them. Um, any any kind of addictions that we struggle, anything that's not God, right? Anything that we struggle with, that's, that's our purpose in life is to ask God for help and do our best um, to become like him. Or as yoga, it is cessation of the thoughts of your mind. What happens when you stop thinking? Why would you want to just stop thinking? Now, to a traumatized person, this sounds good because traumatized people have a lot of thoughts, a lot of negative self-talk, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. So if someone comes to you and says, practice yoga, our purpose is cessation of the thoughts of the mind, stopping the mind. You can just be peaceful and not think. How does that sound? Well, it sounds great <laughs> to somebody who like me, um, and like many of us are struggling with just all these terrible, you know, you should do this, you should do that. You're not doing this enough to da, 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 like, you know, to find peace. So it's, it's a marketing for find peace with yoga. But the reality is stopping the mind would stop your existence. We are fully human beings. We have souls, we have emotions, we have um, mental capacities. We have bodies, like we are alive and that comes with thoughts, but that also comes with, with suffering. That's part of the human experience. So this pitch to stop the mind is almost like a mind death. Like you're going to die, which is kind of what they're talking about having an ego death. But if you really think about that, after you get past the appeal because you're in pain they're promoting you to die like stop thinking stop having an ego drift off into outer space surrender well if you're eastern orthodox it's embrace life yes life is suffering and god is here to help you and you're not alone and people have been struggling with this forever and God is there and there's an afterlife and there's help, you know, you're alive now. So 
it's a completely different intention and direction of where you're going and looking. Yoga, stopping the mind, surrendering ego death. Eastern Orthodoxy, God, life, resurrecting, you know, resurrection, um, just sainthood. Um, I don't know. There's just more conviction of truth. Truth is a big one in the Eastern Orthodox Church. In yoga, there is no truth. You're your own truth. What? Now that I have the Eastern Orthodox perspective, it's very easy to see, yes, there is objective truth. No, you can't just go float around in outer space and make up your own stuff. You're looking at mental problems. So this is why I'm, I, this is another reason I'm talking about this is if you are deep into yoga, you step into it slowly, you could start to develop actual mental problems the more you go because you start getting into territories where you don't start, you don't believe anything's real anymore. You literally are dissolving into nothing. Your mind literally is dying. And I'm not saying that to be funny. Like that's a reality. So with the Eastern Orthodox Church and the concept of absolute truth, you have some grounding. You're standing on the ground again. You know who you are again. You're, you're proud to be who you are as a child of God. You have purpose in your life. You don't want to dissolve your ego or surrender into nothingness and have chitta nita vrota or whatever you call it, chitta nita vritti, I think that's how it's called, cessation of the thoughts of the mind. You don't want that. You want to have God guide your thoughts. Does that make sense? So totally different and it's an upgrade and a big one. So that is that. Um... I guess the last thing uh, that I kind of wanted to mention was the chakras versus the church. So I used to teach a chakra class. And actually, I'm not going to say too much bad about it because it was a lot of fun and it brought a lot of people together. And it was a really happy time in my life. Every Tuesday night, I would teach a class based on one of the chakras. So there's seven. There's an idea that there's seven main energy centers in your body. And each one is associated with a different emotion and a different color. And it can be really in a different body part, right? So um, I would teach a class that was all about one of these chakras. And let's say it was the solar plexus, which is in your belly. And the color is yellow and it governs your digestive system. So we had a lot of fun with pairing different yoga poses with uh, this class. And everyone would dress in yellow. And it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a workout class. You know, I taught it at 24 Hour Fitness, one of these big gyms. Um, and I kind of made it spiritual, like this is your power center, and, blah, blah, blah. and it is, your core literally is your power center when it comes to your body. Um, and it was really fun. But, oh, and also it came with like, uh, the color yellow also was associated with different smells, like lemon being that yellow color. So you, I would sometimes bring um, different essential oils and I would like put them around the students, you know. So it was really, it was a lot of fun. Um, and now that I'm Eastern Orthodox, it has been upgraded. No more chakras. We worship God. And when you go into the chapel, you get incense and you have vestments. So the incense is the most amazing smells you have ever smelled. And it just, it feels like it goes all over your body. Right. <laughs> and then, um, with the colors, there's colors everywhere, all over the icons and the, the vestments of the priests are gorgeous. So any kind of concept of us trying to create this liturgical experience in the yoga class with a chakra class or whatever theme that the yoga class is trying to do is nothing compared to the unbelievable beauty of the divine liturgy or a worship service at the church. It's just, it's all there. So rather than having to smell lemon and think that you're working on your power center, you ask God to help you to grant you strength. And then you smell the incense and you are present in church with your fellows and you dress up, and you stand and you breathe and you sing. And it's incredible. It's really incredible. And 
you work out in a way that lets you be strong enough to stand and worship God. So the intentions have changed, right? You are not more spiritual because you have a good body. You are working out so that you are able to be in the church. Does that make sense? So anyway, those are a few of my points on yoga versus orthodoxy. Um, I hope I covered everything. Let me see if there's anything else that I missed in here. Um, Oh, uh, physically, I think the last thing I wanted to mention was the poses versus <laughs> versus prostrations. Okay, so yoga poses. There is a lot on the online in the online community about like yoga poses. You should never do them because they are dedications to the Hindu gods. So it's terrible for you, and it's inviting demons into your life. Okay, <clears throat> well. From my perspective, doing yoga in the West, in girls' power studios, um, I would say you're not wrong. That, that, that concept isn't wrong per se, but it's turned into a workout. Like most yoga studios, when you're doing the yoga poses to music, they do it to like rap music. Like they're, You're just moving your body and having fun and dancing, basically, and you're learning about your body. So I would, from my personal experience after the years, I, it has fixed my body. It has made me much more aware of where my body is in space. Um, and it was really fun. And um, yes, I would say some practices, if you get into like really spiritual studios, um, they will have specific practices that are intended to create that enlightenment. So it's more of a spiritual focus. Those Potentially, I would say, yes, now looking back, those are a little bit more dangerous. It can get really heady, like this is a spiritual practice. We are, our intention is to become God, is to become enlightened. Whereas most of the studios that you will just, not most, I would have to say you would have to check out the yoga studios, but something like Core Power, if you guys have seen the Core Power, um, these are just, you go, you sweat. <laughs> You know, you do your poses and you leave. It's much less on the spiritual side. So there's levels, there's nuance to this, right? It's not like all right or all wrong. Like, oh, you're going to have demons in your life the second you do yoga. Not necessarily. I think a lot of it is good. <laughs> like, the, like, really, it is stretching. And it's organized stretching in a way that you will do it. A lot of people don't stretch. A lot of people are out of shape. There is a real thing in our society where people just don't work out, ever. This is a one-hour leg class where you stretch and you start to realize things about your body, like, oh, I can't do this. Wow, I'm really out of shape. That'll teach you that. Um, so if you go to a, a class, will it kill you? No. I mean, now, can it turn? Are you playing with fire? Yes, because if you start getting into it, then you'll want to go to those advanced classes that are something like Ashtanga, um, where the intention is enlightenment. It's very rigid. It's like a military class where you're you have a purpose and that purpose is enlightenment. Those are the classes maybe you can avoid because that's a different kind of thing. If you're just going to work out, yes, it does work. Does it give you satisfaction? I mean, yeah, you get a good body. That would be it. Now in orthodoxy, in Eastern orthodoxy, when it comes to your body, I mentioned standing in liturgy and that's a challenge. And so for those of you who are scoffing, you're, like, you're just standing. Well, we do handstands in yoga. Okay. Yeah. Go try it. Go try it you hand standers or chin standers, just go try standing in liturgy mm, three weeks in a row and see how bad your back hurts. I don't care how good you think your spine is after all of those forward folds or how open you think your hamstrings are. Try standing in divine liturgy for three weeks in a row and then come back to me. Literally in the comments, tell me, tell me how you feel. It is sad, yogis, how in shape you think you are and you can't stand. I'm still having problems and I've been going to church for two years now. So anyway, that's, I, I digress. Um, but when it comes to our body, we do have something physical, but the intention's different. We have prostrations. So this is us actually full body bowing all the way down to Christ, all the way down to the ground, back up. Kind of like a burpee, but not really. You're putting your forehead on the ground. It's like a legit prayer. And then you come back up. It will get your heart beating if you do a lot of them. But I would say the intention is different. You are bowing to God. You are giving yourself to God. You can say a name, right? That you are asking for mercy for this person or for yourself 
or that God's will be done, whatever you're asking God, basically his will be done for you or someone else. Um, so we do have a need for having a healthy body. Is it required? Absolutely not. You know, um, for me, I find it a lot harder to do that because the intention is to God rather than a vain uh, practice where you just want to get better because you want a better body, which is what yoga does, which is why it's so enticing. Um, so there's a real struggle internally with prostrations because it's an obedience to God. It's a completely different intention. You getting a nice body is not something that, yeah, could be an outcome, but that's really not what you're doing. Right. I mean, um, but it is very humbling to realize like where your pride comes from and how after you've been practicing yoga, thinking that you are worshiping some kind of God in yoga, like you think you're spiritual and then you come try prostrations and you realize how weak you really are internally. It's really humbling. Um, and at the end of the day, it is true. Uh, and we can get better, but it's so nice to, and it's fulfilling. It's sad to realize how hard it is to do those prostrations because you don't want to, you don't want to surrender to God. So now we're not surrendering to the universe. We are literally putting our whole body down as surrender to God's will. That act, if you've never done a prostration, it is so humbling to put your whole body down. This isn't a yoga pose where you're doing a camel pose or a bridge pose and it looks pretty and you take a picture. This is like, you literally are saying, I don't have anything, God. My whole life is on the ground for you. Like it's a different game, guys. You just upgraded to the real game. And we are unprepared after being in yoga. So in conclusion, I'm kind of getting emotional. Um, in conclusion, I would say I am so glad that I found yoga because I was dying. I was so depressed. I was horribly out of shape. I was spiritually dead. Um, I was very lonely. And I found the gym, I found yoga, I found friends, I found a purpose, although it was not, although it wasn't the real one, it was something to get me up. I got my body back. Um, I had a reason to get out of bed. I learned how to have some confidence. Um, I learned about my body. And as someone who, uh, you know, and I started to explore spirituality. So I was waking up. Um, and I think it prepared me to accept Eastern Orthodoxy when the, when I got the information, when I found out about that Eastern Orthodoxy existed and that I didn't have to give up any of these ideas that I had in orthodoxy of spirituality of there being a spiritual world and there's something more, you know, all of that is there. It just all like becomes brighter. And now you see what's really going on in the world and what your purpose is and kind of that there are real threats and here's actually how we avoid them. Here's how we, so um, here's how we pray. Here's how we ask God. Here's how we learn to do God's will. Here's how we learn to become obedient. Like it is, it, I felt like I have grown up so quickly after being in the church for a couple of years and I'm so much more satisfied. I wouldn't say happy. Um, I would say convicted and I feel like I'm in the right place. Happy, I think, is a word that is overused. Um, when I was in yoga practicing, I was happy. But that was a temporary emotion. Whereas in orthodoxy, it's a long-term purpose-driven life. And it's work. And it's more than happy. 
It's like a joy that is cultivated and available with continued worship and asking God to help. So for anyone still practicing yoga, I get you. I see you. I know why it's great being in yoga. Um, I have zero judgments. Um, I think there's a lot of people that you could see in the Orthodox world talking really badly about people that do yoga, but I understand why you're doing it. Um, and if you are really authentically looking for truth and do want something more fulfilling for your soul and for your heart, I would recommend going to an Orthodox church or looking into Orthodoxy online. The work of Jay Dyer has, uh, was able, his debates that he does with the different worldviews, he debates a lot of pagans or atheists or Muslims. Um, and his work converted me and I quit yoga. And it was the one, it was probably, it, not probably, it was the best decision that I've ever made in my life to become Eastern Orthodox. So um, I read more, I work harder, I feel much more, um, I feel much more proud to just know that I have something to do. Like I have, I'm a child of God and the, and my job is just to go to church and to be and to try to be more like him and to try to do the commandments and try to repent for the things that I've been doing my whole life that were not good, that I knew were not good. But now there's a there's a reason there's there's like light on it. Like now it's very obvious and there's a way to repent and there's forgiveness and it's OK. Like no matter what you did, it's OK and you can bring it to the church. Right. And it's the Orthodox Church that will cure you. So if you have any questions leave some messages. I hope this helps. Um, especially to my girls that are in the yoga community, you guys are awesome. Just like, I, I love you guys. Just, this is, this is our, our next move. <laughs> so, all right. Um, I hope you guys have a good night and all the best.